Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Jonathan Salant, Transportation Writer for the Associated Press and Vice Chair of the Club's Board of Governors. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. Non-members may purchase transcripts, audios, and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of future speakers. Tomorrow, Thursday, May 24th, Amtrak President George Warrington will discuss solutions for our national transportation crisis. On Monday, June 4th, former President Gerald Ford will present the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prizes for distinguished reporting. And on Tuesday, June 5th, Ralph Nader, consumer advocate and former Green Party presidential candidate, will be our guest to talk about concede and consent, the two-party duopoly. If you have any questions for our speaker today, please write them on the cards on your table and pass them up to me. We will ask as many as time permits. I would now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right, Brett Lieberman, Washington correspondent for the Harrisburg Patriot News. John Hughes, transportation reporter from Bloomberg's News. John Crawley, transportation reporter for Reuters News Agency. Stephanie Woods, a reporter for the Nightly Business Report on PBS. William Ussery, AirTran board member and former U.S. Labor Secretary. Frank Alcafer, the chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. Skipping over our speaker for the moment, he gets a nice introduction later. <laughs> uh, Greg Gordon, Washington correspondent for the Star Tribune of Minneapolis and the Speakers Committee luncheon, the Speakers Committee member who, obtained, who organized today's lunch. And Greg, thank you very much. After him is Jim Brown, Director of Corporate Communications for AirTran. Kristen Krauss, the air cargo reporter for Traffic World. Jennifer Michaels, the Washington Bureau Chief for Travel Agent Magazine. And George Edmondson, Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Today's speaker knows the ups and downs of the airline industry. When Joe Leonard took over the helm of air train airways in January of 1999, the low fare carrier had just $25 million in cash and little hope for survival. The company used to be Value Jet Airlines, whose fortunes had sunk into the devastating, after the devastating 1996 crash of Flight 592 into the Florida Everglades. A 30-year veteran, Leonard had seen airlines collapse before. He had been the chief operating officer of Eastern Airlines. At AirTran, he hired a new management team, came up with innovative ways to raise cash, dropped money-losing routes, and launched marketing drives that changed the airline's image from a glorified sky bus for vacationing college students to an airline filled with business travelers. AirTran has been profitable for nine straight quarters. Nonetheless, the airline faces daunting challenges Soaring fuel prices, heavy debt, delays at its Atlanta hub, and most of all, a new wave of mergers among the industry's giants. Leonard has been one of the most aggressive and outspoken critics of the proposed merger between United Airlines and U.S. Airways, which is now before the Justice Department. He says the combined airline would stifle competition along the East Coast. And he has asked federal officials to give AirTrans some coveted spaces at Reagan National Airport that otherwise would go to the post-merger United. Mr. Leonard, we're eager to hear your case. Welcome to the National Press Club. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, and uh, I'm excited to hear some of your questions and join our debate here. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Greg Gordon for uh, his participation today, and I'd also like to thank Frank Aukoffer. Did I get it right, Frank? Yep. Great. <laughs> Chairman of the National Press Club Speakers Committee. 
Um, I'd also like to especially thank my friend Bill Ussery for being here today, a distinguished uh, labor leader for years and the former Secretary of Labor. And there's also some of our uh, customer service and maintenance uh, crew members here today, and I'd like to thank you for coming as well. Being able to discuss issues uh, with the press in a somewhat non-confrontational environment has its advantages for both the speaker and the journalist but I'm sure you'll make up for that uh, later on when we get to questions. At least I hope so. Any business, uh, certainly one uh, that's as public as the airline industry, benefits from a wide variety of debates and discussions about the industry, so let's debate. Allow me to uh, assist in framing the debate, today's bait, debate by giving you a few of my views from a 30-year perspective of somebody that's been in the business of commercial aviation. I'm going to touch on several issues. One is competition. And I'd like to address the industry's con continuing consolidation. The infrastructure is a big problem in our business, including the air traffic control system. And labor seems to be on everybody's mind these days. But before I get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the company that I serve. If for no other reason, to let you know that we have seven flights a day leaving out of Dulles. Uh, every day, and uh, we intend to make that a lot more later on, especially if we could get, get access to Washington National Airport. We're a 700 plus million dollar a year business, serving 34 destinations. So far, only one is international, that's Grand Bahama Islands. Uh, we operate a mixed fleet of DC 9, 30, and Boeing 717 aircraft. The 717 is an airplane that we launched in October of 1999. We're the first new entrant airline to ever launch a new airplane, and we did so with the, with the 717. We've now recorded nine consecutive quarters of profits, and we're one of the few airlines, whether it be national or major, that made money in the first quarter of 2001. We're very proud of that. Although we're a low fare airline, we have created a niche of also serving with a business class cabin which differs us from Southwest, Frontier, Vanguard, and some of the other low fare airlines. Also, unlike some of those, we participate primarily in the major business markets and go head to head with the major airlines in their own backyard. Um, we have a generous frequent flyer program that has a unique feature. If we don't go where you want to go when you redeem your mileage, we'll buy a ticket on one of our competitors to get you there. Uh, so we've done a lot of things to focus our product on business flyers. We're getting one new 717 a month for at least the next 30 months, uh, and we expect to operate no less than 52 717s uh, by the middle of the, of the decade. Our business plan has us growing at 20% per year for the next five years, uh, and so we'll be developing at least two more focused cities over that period as well. We're the 12th largest airline uh, in the United States after the com combination of TWA and American. And we operate a significant hub and spoke system out of Atlanta Hartsville Airport, which happens to be the busiest airport in the world. Our stock price has risen steadily over the past several months, uh, given in part by our continuing profits, our smart business model, and the successful renegotiation of $230 million of debt, long-term debt, that we did in combination with the Boeing company. Boeing, by the way, refinanced our entire debt just as we were preparing to close a deal with traditional investors. In short, they saw a great investment opportunity and in the process forged a stronger partnership with AirTran Airways. Despite some warnings about the state of the industry, with some of the mega carriers reporting continued downward turn in bookings, we continue to do very well. Our bookings remain very strong. In fact, I was notified just before this meeting that yesterday we had an all-time record booking day, booking over three and a half million dollars of traffic yesterday alone. And 51 percent of those bookings came via the internet. We have the largest percentage of bookings over the internet than any domestic airline. In recent surveys, customers have told us that the continued popularity of AirTran is due primarily to the affordable, affordability of our fares. 
So as the economy stalls, airlines like AirTran actually benefit, and we are uh, gaining market share as a result of the economic slowdown. We become similar to our major competitors in that a larger percentage of our revenue now comes from business flyers. About 60 percent of our revenue comes from business flyers versus 40 percent for leisure, and that's just the opposite of two years ago. Two years ago, 60 percent of our revenue came from leisure flyers, and only 40 percent came from business flyers. And why is that? Some new entrants, and there are fewer airlines today than there have been since the Deregulation Act was signed in 1978. Fewer number, fewest number of airlines since 1978. They don't have a network that can help lure a large share of business traffic in their markets. It's that network that helps us survive over the past three years when things were somewhat difficult. We're in some ways a byproduct of Eastern Airlines bankruptcy. When Eastern shut down, we were able to get gates in Atlanta, and we use half of the sea concourse in Atlanta, an operation that would be literally impossible to replicate today. It's virtually impossible to rebuild AirTran Airways or create a new AirTran Airways today because there simply are not 22 gates at any airport in the United States today that it would be available. But what about competition where there is no AirTran, there is no Frontier, there is no JetBlue, no Southwest? In some of those markets, fares over the past couple of years have just skyrocketed. Let's take Washington to Los, Los Angeles. 1998, the fare was $952, not cheap. But today, it's gone up 23% to $1,175. Think of what the last minute customer going mid-continent is going to have to pay when TWA is finally assimilated into American Airlines. Boston to San Francisco, the Y fare is also up 23% to $1,200. And even New York to Miami, a market that's been fairly competitive over the years, the fare has risen 52.8% in the last three years alone to $1,038. I remember at Eastern where we used to get 79 bucks for that frequently. Why is it happening? Well, it's happening because it can. It's happening because there are fewer competitors. It's happening because the major airlines have agreed to 12 system-wide fare increases since 1999 alone. The only markets where there's healthy, low-cost competition is where low-fare carriers complete, compete. It's simply the law of the marketplace. The more markets that we and airlines like us penetrate, the more victorious the air travel consumer will be. The recent dismissal of the case against American Airlines was bought by the Justice Department does not bode well for low fare competition. The, this case was the first ever formal complaint filed for predatory pricing in the airline industry. Unfortunately, the DOJ was not able to even get the case to trial, which shows how difficult it is in proving predatory behavior, even when it's so blatantly obvious that it occurred. The pattern of Americans' behavior against new entrants at its Dallas hub was not unique. AirTran has experienced this sort of predatory behavior in a number of markets, and as a result has filed complaints against uh, several carriers at both the Department of Transportation and the Department of Justice. So far, we've not received any relief. So one of the questions before us today is, what kind of role should the federal government play in encouraging further development of fair competition uh, and in encouraging future development? Does it have the right, for example, to reallocate the use of airport gates and now valuable landing and takeoff slots at airports like Washington National in order to foster affordable com competition. And as a policy matter, should the federal government exercise its authority to take decisive action against airline companies that unfairly use their market dominance to compete? We say the answer is a qualified yes. Many of us are old enough to remember the days before deregulation. There was less air traffic congestion. 
uh, you typically got fed a little more in flight. But the fares were outrageous, and most Americans, and that meant for most Americans that they could fly maybe once, maybe even twice a year for non-business travel. Obviously, that's all changed. The airline business has truly become a public mode of transportation. And the change in role and the business is under a different, often heightened level of uh, scrutiny. Fortunately, safety has been and will continue to be the number one priority in how we and other airlines manage their business. It must be a never-ending number one priority. That's why the FAA needs to get the kind of budget from the Bush administration that will keep the U.S. leading innovation in the traffic of safety. But it's also been a business rack with growing pains, with demand for the products that's bursting at the seams in some of the markets. The lack of investment in the country's aviation infrastructure is beginning to take its toll. We don't have vitally needed new runways at Atlanta and New York and Chicago and other places so that new carriers like us can enter the market. At Hartsville, we were able to convert 18 gates into 22 gates, but, that's, but with that capacity, we'll soon be maxed out in Atlanta, probably within the next two years. Many other carriers are facing the same problem, and in many other places as well. What can the government do to ensure that low fare carriers have access to these necessary facilities? First, one way is to encourage the use of gates as efficiently as possible. Are you aware that there are currently leases at most airports in the country where airlines have exclusive use of the gates, and they use that exclusivity to bar carriers like AirTran from entering the market even though the gates are grossly underutilized on a regular basis? Case in point is at LaGuardia. I think TWA has five gates at LaGuardia and they've never had more than a two-level operation in the last few years. For most of the day, with exception of one flight a day, they have a one-level operation, five gates, four of them sitting empty all day long uh, at one of the busiest airports in the country. It's a ridic ridiculous situation. The situation is not without hope, however. The Window Ford Aviation Investment and Reform Act, commonly known as Air 21, requires major U.S. airports to come up with competition plans in order to receive federal grants or impose or increase passenger head taxes. We can't overlook our, the efforts of one of our major competitors in Atlanta. Delta uh, has recently completed an alteration of their hub and spoke network. Delta recently spread their banks out for connecting flights over a larger period of, of the day, apparently in part to relieve the congestion during certain peaks where their operations alone exceeded the capacity of the airport. Although it hasn't been reported up to now, AirTran did exactly the same thing at about the same time Delta was, was stretching their schedule. We've now spread our 148 daily flights into two more banks. We went from seven banks to nine banks. And this will create an even more, a more even flow of traffic, not only in Atlanta, but throughout the region. So we should see a much better operation in and out of Atlanta this summer than we saw last summer. There's also been some suggestions recently, probably um, driven by fears of a repeat of last summer's terrible delays, that the airlines should be given temporary authority to discuss reorganizing schedules among them. There's probably some wisdom in allowing a very limited temporary authority, but we should be very careful in how far down that road we move. We already have a very consolidated industry, far more than most of us ever believed back in the 70s. Some of the same airlines asking for antitrust immunity are still under a consent decree by the Department of Justice, resulting from a 1990s price-fixing uh, case. If the government allows too much freedom to discuss what is normally undiscussable, we might find ourselves with even less competition. Second, the DOJ, despite the loss of American Airlines in the predatory pricing case, should continue to exercise its statutory responsibility to determine where the unfair market dominance and predatory behavior might exist 
due to potential um, merger activity. It seems to have done a very thorough job in analyzing the U.S. Air and United consolidation. As you might know, we file papers with both DOT and DOJ and have been quite aggressive in testifying before Congress uh, in that regard. We believe that a condition of that should be to the requirement to divest of gates and slots at Washington National and LaGuardia and other airports, or that the merger should not be permitted. We await the DOT's findings, and we've said a lot about that, so enough said today. Third, the DOT needs to recognize its existing authority under federal law, which is expansive, to review predatory and uncompetitive practices in the airline business and, when necessary, to take action to ensure that the airline competition remains uh, uh, val uh, valid. DOT should be given more statutory authority to spend the billions of dollars that are now sitting idle in the nation's airport and and the Airways Trust Fund. There's a huge surplus in the fund. It's over $14 billion. Here's the bottom line. Spend the money that's already been collected and intended for infrastructure improvement. It's not doing anybody any good sitting there collecting interest. Off and on over the years, individuals and private groups have called for partial or full privatization of the nation's air traffic control system. While we don't think full privatization will do anybody any good, we do believe that a corporate structure might give the FAA and the ATC system the ability to make more efficient upgrades and faster to our transportation network. Our industry should develop a new coalition that will help push everyone toward a common solution that will create governmental structure for the ATC system that will serve us well into the late 21st century. And we need that consensus now. Finally, we, look, we need to look at a new airline labor management relations. The two major airlines, American and United, are both faced with potential strikes this summer. And the unfortunate situation at Com Air has everyone wondering what the outcome there is going to be. Even airlines contracts that took years to negotiate ended up with strikes or near strikes such as the case of the airline, uh, Northwest Airlines Mechanics Union, which very likely would have struck had it not been for presidential intervention. Today, airline labor management tactics and the federal rules that govern our industry labor management issues may well reshape the future of our industry in ways that neither side intends. What, if anything, might be the fault here? Is it so much is it, is it much agitation, so much agitation, the natural result of the changing economic conditions, or does the labor law that governs the contract, the Railway Labor Act, the real problem? I don't know. But the act was meant in part to protect the stability of the public transport system, and it does that. So that labor unions had to go through a methodical process in order to gain the right strike. This is quite different from other industries where when the contract expires, it simply expires. There's another area that needs industry, con this is another area that needs industry consensus. Airline managers, labor representatives, and other interested groups must find a common ground for change before change can occur. Should we simply use mediators for the purpose that they were meant, and that is to mediate and not determine the outcome? Then if the process stops and you members authorize a strike, should they be free to strike, or is there a larger public interest? We won't know what the impact of such change would be until we simply give it a chance to happen. We in the industry, and even our passengers, must know that the status quo is simply unacceptable. As I said when I started, there's plenty in the industry to debate, but debates are the road to resolution. And of course, that's where the fourth estate fits in. So let's debate. I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This weekend, uh, I experienced what so many passengers complain about. My flight was an hour late. Why are customers so dissatisfied with airline service? 
Uh, I think people are dissatisfied because the service isn't very good. I mean, uh, the delays are uh, going up uh, throughout the industry. Uh, our, uh, one statistic that I tell people that they're surprised to hear, the average speed of our airplanes over the past uh, 24 months has decreased by 30 miles an hour. Now, we don't fly the airplane slower, so how did you get slower? Well, it's taxi out times, reroutes, diversions, um, dodging thunderstorms, and that sort of thing. And I think in many airlines, the, um, the response to that is indifference. And um, so I think there has to be a, a step up in the level of performance. Um, before people will give us credit for, for doing that. I think some of the moves that we made in Atlanta, uh, we and Delta, will certainly improve our situation there. And, uh, but the Northeast is going to be a struggle again this summer, and I don't think it's going to be uh, significantly better than last summer because there hasn't been anything done with the infrastructure. In fact, uh, let's talk about that. With the economy slowing and uh, what, what is your outlook for the summer's travel season? Do you expect this summer to be worse, better, the same as last summer? And also, what impact will fuel prices have on your uh, airplanes this summer? Uh, our bookings actually look pretty good. The, although everybody that I talk to in the industry, there's a very, very significant softening of bookings, uh, primarily among business flyers. Leisure travel uh, continues to rem remain strong. Uh, there was an attempted fare increase this week that didn't hold up. I think the fact that people are trying to get fares up would indicate they're looking at soft bookings and trying to make the revenues up um, uh, through by getting fares higher. Uh, fuel is, is uh, very expensive. It's up from last year. Uh, all of the experts tell me that they think it will go down in the second half of the year. Um, but that remains to be seen. There's plenty of crude oil available, but there's a very significant shortage of um, refining capacity. Uh, that's actually a much bigger problem than crude. Uh, we are hedged at about 30 percent. We've been waiting for dips to put in additional hedges, but there really haven't been any dips uh, as of late. Is AirTran still suffering from the value jet crash? And how do you convince people that you're not value jet? Uh, I would say that the vast majority of our customers in, in Atlanta know the, the history of our company and that uh, we are the uh, ValueJet was a predecessor of our company and they don't really care. Uh, they believe that we're safe. Uh, they believe that we give excellent customer service. Uh, the people outside of Atlanta r rarely uh, even equate the, our current airline with, with uh, ValueJet. I will tell you that we just went through four inspections. We had a regional FAA inspection. We had a national FAA inspection. We had a Department of Defense inspection. And we had a Transportation Inspector General's inspection. Those all occurred in a two-month period of time. And we came through all four of those in very, very um, uh, excellent uh, position. Uh, we uh, have a safety department. And we do uh, constant audits internally with our uh, safety folks. So. I feel very good about our um, safety record and, uh, and the quality of our operation at this point. A lot of speakers want to know about the uh, U.S. Air uh, United merger. Many observers have said that because the Justice Department still has not made a ruling that the deal is dead. Do you agree? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, I certainly believe that the deal is not going to go through the way it's currently designed. I think there, there will be significant changes to the deal if it in fact goes through. Uh, our understanding is that United is still pressing, for, trying to press forward. Uh, there's been very little activity in Washington uh, recently. Uh, we have listening posts uh, pretty much everywhere, so when things happen we tend to know about it very quickly. And there's been very little activity, but uh, our information would indicate that United is still pressing forward, but I do not believe Justice Department will permit it to go through without some changes to the current form of the deal. If uh, you can't get the gates, you've asked for it national, and the merger goes through, how would that affect AirTran? Will you be able to survive? And also, how does the DC Air proposal uh, affect AirTran? Well, the D.C. Air proposal is something that we would like. I think, uh, and quite frankly, I believe that if United and U.S. Air and uh, D.C. Air had teamed up with us last year, the deal would already been closed. Uh, I think if there, if um, we would obviously very much like to have the gates and slots that uh, 
were presented uh, to DC Air or some other uh, gate and slot combination, uh, that would absolutely be a home run hit for us. Uh, and we would put significant resources in the Washington National as fast as we could put them in. Having one airplane coming every month for the next 30 months, we've got a lot of airplane capability to, to add in the, any new markets that we go into. Uh, if we don't get into Washington National, we'll go somewhere else. Uh, and we've uh, got a short list of um, cities that will be our next focus city. We haven't declared what that'll be yet. Uh, we put a couple of placeholders out in uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Uh, but we will decide probably in the next three or four months where our next focus city is and then we will develop uh, very um, significant resources to that uh, focus city. We, but our first choice would clearly be Washington National to, do, to make that our second um, hub operation. There's been several bills in Congress to put a moratorium on mergers, including United U.S. Air. Uh, should Congress block the merger? Well, we've always been for the merger. Uh, we believe that the merger should go forward. We do believe that U.S. Air is in a very tight spot, uh, but we do believe that it should not be permitted to go forward without some significant divestitures to permit real low fare uh, competition and to create some new real competition. The fact of the matter is the major airlines do not compete with themselves on, on fares. Um, and they sort of have a gentleman's agreement on, on uh, their, comp their competing. The only time you get real competition is when you bring somebody like Southwest or AirTran or JetBlue into the marketplace to create and stimulate new traffic and to uh, create real fair competition in the marketplace. If the uh, deal goes through, do you expect other major airlines to uh, consolidate? If the deal goes through, I don't think uh, uh, Delta, Northwest, and Connell have any choice but to figure out somehow how they get together. I think the, you know, the American TWA has already occurred, and if U.S. Air United goes through, uh, I think that leaves the remaining three big airlines in a significant disadvantage, and they have virtually no choice uh, but, uh, but to uh, get together. And so you're going to end up with three or four airlines probably three that will absolutely, totally, and completely dominate the marketplace, and it will be the end of uh, competition unless there's some, the government steps in and does something to create new competition, i.e. Um, provide assets to people like us. What about AirTran? Could you be a takeover candidate or merge with somebody? Have you discussed uh, any consolidations or mergers? We really are going, uh, our business model works very, very well. And uh, our plan is to uh, develop our company from within, uh, add an airplane a month, uh, retire one every other month or so. And we believe that that's the best course of action for us. Uh, we've not had conversations with other folks about either acquiring us or acquiring someone else. Um, we believe that we should be a very attractive marketing partner for any number of airlines that don't have a large presence in the southeast. Uh, we have had some discussions about that with, with a number of different airlines uh, as in the way of a code share or a frequent flyer type program. And um, I think down the road that will probably occur. In the past they were all trying to kill us, so nobody really wanted to associate with us. But I think now that it's pretty clear that we're going to be around and our product offering is, uh, has incredible acceptance, that that will change in due course. There have been more bills introduced this session of Congress regarding airlines and HMOs. Uh, do you see any movement to actually pass any legislation? And if so, what bills uh, do you think should be passed? Uh, there's a number of bills for consumer uh, rights uh, uh, that are moving forward. I think it's, those are moving because there's an incredible um, frustration with the level of service uh, that exists in the industry. I don't think it's a good idea to try to regulate customer service. I think if you permit good competition, that the competition will take care of itself. And I think those bills are very difficult to, the, the rules of those bills would be very, very difficult to enforce and probably not effective. Um, so uh, that's where, you know, we sort of focused our attention. Do you think there should be any re-regulation of any sort of the airline industry? 
Uh, I'm not an advocate of, of re-regulation. Uh, I think deregulation has done what it was intended to do, which was to dramatically a, uh, increase service, increase competition, um, and lower fares, and make flying affordable and available to uh, the American public. And I think it's been very successful at doing that. I think, however, if this consolidation continues at the pace it's going, without some mechanism to reinvigorate competition um, at, at the end of this cycle, we could end up with a situation where all those benefits will start uh, disintegrating. Do you expect the new administration to take action administratively to increase competition? Uh, well, I certainly hope so. Uh, we've been over our association, uh, Air Carrier Association, has met with uh, Secretary Mineta. Uh, he's clearly an individual that is very, very knowledgeable about the industry, he has been involved when he was in the Congress uh, with the Aviation Subcommittee. Uh, so he's very much up on the issues. We have encouraged him to use jawboning as an effective technique, which I do believe is effective, uh, in some of this predatory uh, activity that occurs in the industry, and to um, move forward in a way to make sure that uh, he is creating an atmosphere so that carriers like us can compete. We've always said we, we're not afraid to compete. We're not asking for subsidies. We're not asking for handouts. All we want to do is get access to airports so that we can, in fact, put our product in there and then let the customer decide whether they want to pick our product or the mainline carrier's product. One uh, writer sends a card. We know service is lousy. What are the reasons for it? Uh, I think in general the reasons are that uh, the air traffic control system has not kept up with, with the growth of, of air travel is one of the major reasons, and I think uh, lack of competition is the other. I mean, um, you have these uh, large um, major carriers and large hubs, and there's always a, we were talking about it at lunch, there's always a love-hate relationship with the mega carrier in your hub city. But they provide a great service, uh, but they tend to be dominant. And I think there has to be um, action on the government's part to make it easier for people like us to go into the, to the marketplace uh, and compete. In Philadelphia, for instance, uh, we don't even have any gate. We operate uh, at United Airlines, uh, they, their gate, their service, and we always get second choice when there's a problem. They push us off the gate. They don't let us come into the gate. Um, so it's not surprising that our customer dissatisfaction in Philadelphia is one of the highest in our system. Should airlines be required to tell passengers when they make a reservation that a particular flight, the flight they want to fly on, is delayed maybe 40, 50, 60 percent of the time? Uh, I certainly don't have any objection to that. Uh, I don't know what it really does. I don't think, you know, we have that, that data is available today on, on the um, reservation screen and if you book on the internet uh, it's frequently available so I don't think it's a major I don't think it would change people's buying pattern people normally are picking the flights based on uh, first availability uh, are you going when I want to go and second um, uh, what the price is so I don't think it would really have any impact on people's choice uh, and the situation is very dynamic uh, we change our schedules constantly because you can have a flight at 10.05 and it arrives on time and some other airline can change their schedule and the next month it could be arriving 15, 20 minutes late. So then you make an adjustment there and the next month it's back on time. So this is a very dynamic situation. It changes constantly. Um, last night uh, we had an example we pushed out of uh, LaGuardia. We knew we were going to be 30 minutes late. They told us that because of the taxi out time. When we got to the number three position for takeoff, they had a thunderstorm uh, come in over Washington National, and uh, we ended up an hour and a half late. Well, nobody could predict that. Nobody really knew about that. That was something that occurred real time. And uh, I think the real thing is to make sure that your service personnel have the data they need, accurate data, so that they can keep people informed of the situation. And um, my experience has been if you keep people informed and let them make judgments, uh, they'll give you, a, they'll go a long way with you and cut you quite a break. 
Why do airlines, knowing that an airport can't possibly handle all of the scheduled flights, continue to schedule flights for that time at that terminal? Uh, the simple answer is because that's when the customers want to go. I mean, uh, you really put your schedules in uh, based on uh, when you know the customers want to go. And if, if the customers want to leave at noon and you decide to be a nice guy and help the air traffic control system out and leave at 11 o'clock, well, you're going to leave empty. And it won't be long. You'll be back scheduling your flight at, 11, at 12 o'clock. So it really is customer driven. Uh, uh, and that creates the peakings. Customers, certainly business flyers, they want to leave in the morning, they want to come back at night. Uh, and so that really is what creates the peaking problem. Do airports have enough projected capacity with the runways being planned and other expansion plans to handle future passengers? No, I, I mean, they can't, we really can't adequately handle the passengers that are there today. Uh, a number of airports are grossly overcrowded. Uh, since I joined the industry 30 years ago, there's only one net new airport that's been added to this country uh, of a major, uh, you know, major uh, regional type airport uh, in 30 years, and uh, very few uh, runways. Uh, they're working, you know, taking forever to make the decision to put a runway in Chicago. We have uh, approval now to put a fifth runway in Atlanta, so there's a little bit of capacity coming on. And then I think the other thing is, is certainly the regional jet phenomena has really made the situation much worse uh, because these airplanes don't carry a lot of people, but they fly at the same altitudes as the major, as the big airplanes do, and they're really cobbing up the air traffic control system significantly using uh, big portions of, of airspace. Uh, and that, situa that has made the situation much worse in the last few years. There's a bill, in fact, the Senate Commerce Committee tomorrow is scheduled to vote on legislation that to speed up the process of approving new runways, uh, basically shorten the time it would take to get environmental permitting. Do you support such a proposal? Uh, absolutely. I think that it has to, it has to be sped up. I think, you know, we're, we're seeing it really across the board. Uh, electrical power generation infrastructure is not been developed um, um, for refining capacity. I just mentioned that the real problem driving uh, fuel prices is not uh, supply of crude oil, it's the uh, capability to refine it into raw product. So there's been, there's been very few refineries built in the last 25 years and airports and runways are in the same situation. There's only been one new airport in, the 30, in 30 years. So there really has to be a uh, significant improvement in capability and it has to be much, much faster process. This is very, very painful to uh, go through the processes to get even one runway added to an airport that already exists. Major carriers are required to submit monthly data on their on-time performances to the Department of Transportation. You do not. Why don't you and how does your time uh, performance rate with the other carriers? Uh, we are not required because we're not designated as a major airline, and that's the major airline is an airline with a, with a billion dollars in revenue or more. We uh, anticipate being a major airline by the end of 2002, and we will start reporting at that time. Our performance, uh, certainly in the last three months, is probably one of the best in the industry. Our completion factor has always been at the very top of the industry. Uh, right now, I think for the month of May, we're running 99.4 percent completion factor. Our rival performance is in the low 80s, which would probably put us in the number one position. Our bag numbers are at 3.4, which probably put us in number one or number two. So we're running a superb airline right now and have uh, really uh, concentrated this year to uh, make sure that we are at the top of the industry. Our goals are to be in the top three in completion factor and in the top half of the industry in both uh, baggage numbers, passenger complaints, and arrival uh, performance within 15 minutes. And I, I'm confident we'll meet, meet all of those requirements by the end of the year. Do you get fair treatment from the press and uh, examples of yes or no? Uh, we get good treatment from the good guys <laughs> <laughs> and bad treatment from the bad guys. <laughs> no, I think we're treated very fairly. I do believe that uh, 
the constant hammering away every article starting with uh, Airtran, formerly Valued Jet, ta 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 ta, <laughs> was unfair because I think it's way, way in our past and is not done with other carriers uh, that have had uh, similar or much worse experiences than ours. It's just not done. So I thought that was a bit unfair, but I think other than that, though, I think we get a real uh, uh, balanced reporting uh, um, in general, and I, I don't really have a lot of complaints. We have a number of questions about the Federal Aviation Administration's recent ruling clarifying requirements for crew rest, limiting duty hours to 16 hours a day. Is AirTran already in compliance, or will you wait until November 17th when the FAA says it will enforce the rules to comply? Yeah, we're already in compliance as best we know. We're going through the thing in detail uh, to make sure that uh, that there's not something we missed. There are some definitional changes in this thing that kind of change the definition of what a flight is. We're checking against that, but as best we know, we are in compliance and have been for quite a long, quite a long time. The pilots' unions are meeting today to discuss the whole issue of air, uh, pilot fatigue. Is that a problem? And if so, uh, what should be done? Uh, it can be a problem if, if uh, depending on the circumstances and and. Uh, uh, it, it usually doesn't occur when, when normal scheduling occurs. It use, you usually occur when there's back-to-back -back events. Uh, one of the things that these new rules will do is it's going to add more delays in uh, flight returns and gate returns and that sort of thing. Because under the old rules, if you were, uh, let's say you're taxiing out at LaGuardia, which is always a thrill, and uh, you're projected to... It, when you pushed off the gate, if you were projected to land within 16 hours, you could continue the flight. Now, if you haven't taken off and your flight is now projected to go beyond 16 hours, you're going to have to return to the gate and there's not likely to be a crew there. So it's likely to turn into a gate return and a cancellation. Um, um, what was the latter part, point? The latter part of that, the, is there, what should be done? Oh, I think, uh, you know, the rules that are in effect, I think, will, will go a long way. One of the things that we do and have always done as a matter of policy, if a crew declares themselves fatigued, they get off the plane. And there's no, there's no question about that. There's no um, uh, situation, and that occurs occasionally. Uh, you get in a real off-schedule operation, and people aren't flying, and they've been on duty a long time, or or they have a bad, it may not be the amount of time, but the sequence in which they did things, uh, and if they declare themselves fatigued, that's it. They get off the airplane, we we'll go find another crew. Was President, right, uh, President Bush right to intervene in the Northwest Airlines labor dispute? Should he continue and step in to prevent any strikes? Well, I don't know. I think he was certainly, I think he was right in that case, and I think, uh, I think, you know, I think with the consolidation of the industry um, to so few carriers that to uh, permit w one company to provide the disruption to the economic national economy as an airline strike can occur with these very, very large airlines, I think, you know, there is some justification for doing that. I think the last thing that we want as a matter of national policy is having Congress pass laws decreeing that this is your labor contract. So that's why I don't know the answer to the situation, but the labor situation is the worst I've seen it in 30 years in the airline industry and seems to be getting worse. I think we've got to do something different, but I certainly uh, you know, don't have the solution, but I would suggest that there really should be a group of people come together and see if they're in a the better way to do handle labor relations in the airline industry. Why do you think it's uh, so bad? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, it's just sort of a situation that is continuing to escalate, and uh, it's never been great, uh, but it seems to be uh, sort of feeding on itself right now uh, with a very militant attitude, and uh, uh, it may be, again, part of the situation where when you consolidate, uh, the airlines that remain have so much power, and the unions at those airlines have so much power uh, that maybe the balance has been, has been lost over a period of time. The head of Amtrak will be here tomorrow, and standing where you are standing right now. 
Uh, what is your view of train travel as part of the transportation mix, and should the U.S. continue to subsidize Amtrak travel? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about the subsidy. Uh, I'm not an advocate of, of subsidies, and like I said, when, when we go to Washington to plead our case, we've never asked for a subsidy. We've only asked for access uh, so that we can, in fact, compete. Um, so as, as a personal situation, I don't, I'm not an advocate of subsidies. As far as tra train travel, I think that they are a viable competitor to air travel, certainly in the high-density northeast area. And uh, I think as an uh, industry, we need to compete with them, and I'm sure that uh, there are opportunities that they see uh, to take advantage of some of the situations that we have and, and try to develop their business from that. And I think they're a uh, uh, viable player in that. I know I live in Florida. I know Florida's looking at, you know, running trains from Tampa to Orlando and Tampa to Miami and things like that. I think that's uh, viable, but I think it ought to have to stand on its own merits and be funded by people who are willing to pay whatever it takes for that mode of transportation. Because of delays, more customers want to carry their baggage on board. Do you favor a uh, two-bag or a one-bag limit? Uh, surprisingly, we, we favor as many as you want to bring. Uh, on our 717s, we actually uh, bought an option uh, for extra large bins, and uh, our bin capacity is the same cubic feet per passenger as you would get on a 747-400. So we view, we view this as a competitive advantage. Uh, we've also set up all of our stations with slides on the jetway so that if we do get overfill, we can handle those extra bags efficiently and fast. Um, and in fact, uh, we're in somewhat of an argument with our, the Orlando airport that we want them to remove the stencil. They have these uh, uh, outlines so that you can't get through security if your bag is too big. We want those removed. We've made a formal complaint uh, Continental filed a lawsuit at Dulles and won that because uh, they also view that as a competitive advantage. So we encourage our customers to bring their baggage on board. Our flight attendants are very good at helping people find places to put them. And to the extent that we fill the airplane up, we're very efficient at getting them down below and on board the airplane in the shortest amount of time. What is your reaction to the Transportation Department's apparent decision to drop efforts to adopt guidelines defining anti-competitive practices by established airlines? Well, I think at the end of the day, we're kind of glad they did, uh, primarily because the guidelines were so watered down by the time, by the considerable lobbying effort by the major airlines, that they were totally and completely meaningless. So our view and, and the view of the Air Carrier Association was that we'd be better off with, without the guidelines than the guidelines that were uh, ultimately uh, negotiated. So um, we believe that the, tra we don't believe, we know that the Transportation Department has a much more authority than they have been, uh, been using to uh, put pressure on airlines to change their behavior when they're misbehaving. Uh, and we have made that point to, uh, uh, Secretary Mineta, and we hope that he will be uh, active and aggressive in uh, pursuing the authority that he already has. Boeing has a plan to modernize the air traffic control system. Do you support that approach? Uh, I'm not an expert on, on Boeing's approach. Uh, I know it's a, a GPS system, and I certainly believe that uh, that would be a, a fairly quick way to modernize the system. And, uh, uh, you know, most even small Piper airplanes today have GPSs in them. So I think an upgrade is, is, is needed. It's clearly, is clearly evident. We're not using the airspace as efficiently as we can, and I think the accuracy of a GPS system would certainly uh, permit us to reduce the spacing of airplanes en route. Uh, Two members of our head table are pregnant, and uh, in fact, we have also two new fathers at the head table, and uh, their wives would have experienced this too. Are you doing anything to make flying easier for very pregnant women? 
Well, we, we have a uh, special feature at AirTran, and that is regardless of what fare you paid for your ticket, you can upgrade at the gate for $25 to business class, and I would say that would be a uh, wonderful way for you to travel. <laughs> Before we ask our last question, I wanted to award you our certificate of appreciation for the, uh, for, and our National Press Club coffee mug. Thank you very much. And finally, our last question. Why doesn't AirTran have a cute cartoon character like ValueJet? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the cartoon character, and I thought I think everybody did. There was clearly a move at the time to move away from ValueJet in all respects when the uh, company merged with AirTran. And uh, so the critter, as he was uh, known as uh, kind of fell by the wayside. Uh, but, you know, we'll look at those things. Right now, all of our promotion is, is pretty much retail, and uh, uh, we sell price, 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 because that's what the customers say that they pick from us. But as we move forward trying to develop uh, image advertising down the road, uh, we may uh, reintroduce some of those concepts. Well, thank you again. Uh, Mr. Leonard, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd also like to thank the audience, and I'd like to thank National Press Club members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie Abdo, Dermot, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's lunch. Also, thanks to the National Press Club Library for its research. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>